Welcome. I suppose some of you are wondering how it is that I, a retired Minnesota trial lawyer with no formal academic credentials on the subject of African American history or slavery, comes to Fort Snelling tonight to talk about my biography of an African American man and about the subject of slavery in Minnesota. I can tell you the precise moment when I embarked down the path that brings me here tonight. It occurred 17 years ago at the Brown County Historical Society in New Ulm, Minnesota. I had gone to New Ulm to research a family story my grandfather had told me as a child about how one of my ancestors had been killed during the Dakota War of 1862. Grandpa had told me that there were some records in the museum in New Ulm that told the story of our ancestor's death and that there was a monument with his name on it out in the country at the spot where he was killed. My goal in going to New Ulm was to see if I could learn enough about the story of my ancestor's death to write a booklet for my children and for the many members of my extended family. With the assistance, assistance of an extremely helpful librarian in New Ulm, I was able to reconstruct that story from various accounts in the files of the Brown County Historical Society. But one of the documents I received on that visit captivated me more than any others. It was an emergency dispatch written by the sheriff of Brown County to Minnesota's Governor Alexander Ramsey late in the evening of August 18, 1862, the first day of the Dakota War. The sheriff, after describing the killings of most of the 50 residents of the village of Milford, six miles west of New Ulm, the place where my ancestor was killed, wrote these words, quote, it was, I am informed, Wabashaw's band, a Negro leading them, who committed the murders, close quote. The words Negro leading were underlined by the sheriff for emphasis. Other accounts written by eyewitnesses to the scene at Milford reported that a black man daubed in war paint and wearing a breech cloth was seen among the Dakota warriors there. Now, no one in my family had ever mentioned that a black man was involved in the killing of our ancestor, let alone that he was supposedly the leader of a Dakota War Party. I immediately began to ask myself questions. Who was he? How did he come to be living in rural Minnesota in 1862? And did he, as the sheriff claimed, play a leading role in the killings at Milford, where more whites were slain than at any other single location during the Dakota War? Within a month or two, I wrote that booklet, booklet for my family. And I included uh, what I knew then, which was not very much, about Joseph Godfrey, because it was easy to identify the black man in war paint. His name was Joseph Godfrey. He's mentioned in almost every history of the Dakota War, and has been since the first histories were written shortly after the war. He was the only man with no Dakota blood to fight on the Dakota side of that war but he's best known for his role in the military trials that followed the war. He was the first defendant to face death penalty charges in those trials, but over the six weeks of the trials, he increasingly was called upon as a prosecution witness. And he gave evidence against a number of Dakota warriors, including, I think, eight of the men out of 38 of the men who were hanged at Mankato in December of 1862. His testimony was particularly against the men who killed the settlers at Milford. But not one of the many Dakota War histories written before the last few years even hinted at the fact, which we now know to be true, that Joseph Godfrey was born into slavery right here in Minnesota, raised and abused as a Minnesota slave, and late in his teenage years, ran away from his Minnesota slave masters to seek refuge as a fugitive slave among the Dakotas. He was, as far as we know, Minnesota's only homegrown fugitive slave. And for every year of the 17 or so years Godfrey spent in bondage in Minnesota, the practice of slavery was illegal here under federal law. But as often happens in slavery, there was almost no contemporaneous written evidence of Godfrey's existence 
prior to the Dakota War, let alone details about his life. He had lived in Minnesota for more than 30 years before the war, but his name did not appear in any census, on any fur trade records, on any Indian records, in any letter or journal, or in any book or newspaper article, at least none I could find. In fact, if he had died of natural causes the day before the Dakota War had broken out, we probably would have no idea today that a black Minnesotan named Joseph Godfrey ever existed. It was only after he became a notorious figure during the war that people started to write about him, including a few references to the fact that he was a slave uh, that I received fairly early on in my research in isolated accounts that were written almost 40 years after the Dakota War. So that, that was the first time anyone had said anything about Godfrey being a slave in much, much later accounts. And when I saw those accounts at first, I was very skeptical about their truth. I asked myself, why didn't anyone mention this fact in 1862 when Godfrey became a recognized public figure? Why didn't Minnesota's most famous or most, uh, originally the most famous historian, William Watts Falwell, who conducted exhaustive research before writing his four-volume history of Minnesota that was published in the 1920s, why didn't he refer to Godfrey's enslavement in his books? And by the way, uh, I, uh, I'm sure that Falwell knew that, that Godfrey was a slave because his records indicate that he had that knowledge, but he chose not to put it in his book. I've come to see that Godfrey's life is an important but relatively small part of a much broader and largely ignored history of African Americans in Minnesota, of slavery in Minnesota, and of the role played by the United States Army in bringing slavery to this region of America. Though much of the biography of Joseph Godfrey I've written deals with the story of his involvement in the Dakota War and in the war's aftermath, I won't be talking today about those subjects. Instead, I've chosen to focus on the part of Godfrey's life with which everyone is least familiar, and to try to place his life as a Minnesota slave into a clearer perspective. And I'm particularly glad to be doing that here for reasons that will become obvious. This place, Fort Snelling, is really the place one needs to understand in order to understand the history of slavery in Minnesota. No place is more suiting, suited as a site to be talking about Joseph Godfrey and about slavery in Minnesota than this place. The exact year Godfrey was born may never be known with certainty, as was common in slavery, though it was sometime between 1827 and 1835. My best guess from all the evidence is that he was probably born around 1830. He may have been born here at Fort Snelling, for his enslaved mother was first brought to the fort by Captain John Garland in 1826. Or Godfrey may have been born in the household of the prominent fur trader, Alexis Bailey, who lived just across the river from the fort in Mendota. For Bailey purchased Godfrey's mother, mother from Captain Garland no later than 1831. Godfrey himself said in 1862 that he spent his early years living in the household of Alexis Bailey. In the course of trying to put Godfrey's life as a Minnesota slave into perspective, I spent several years poring over everything I could find in the collections of the Minnesota Historical Society and in collections at other history centers, libraries, in the National Archives, and elsewhere. And then two Minnesotans who were knowledgeable about Fort Snelling gave me copies of two Army pay forms signed by officers posted at this fort. One was a pay, pay voucher for Colonel Josiah Snelling, after whom this fort was named, that was dated in 1826 or 7. The other was an identical form submitted by an Army surgeon, Dr. John Emerson, in about 1836. And a thunderbolt struck when I looked at those two official Army forms. Colonel Snelling and Dr. Emerson, when I noticed that they had both written down in their forms that their servants were slaves. <laughs>
I had spent several years poring over all the records I could find trying to reconstruct the history of slavery. And not until that point, here in Minnesota, not until that point did I realize that the United States Army had kept official records that documented the practice of slavery, at least to some extent, in this region. Now, we'll see if I can get this system to work. Here's a copy of the pay voucher for Colonel Snelling that's similar to the one I was given. Now, I know, can you hear me when I'm still walking like this? All right. I know that the print on here is too small for you, much of it for you to read, but let me just indicate what, is, what this form is about. You see it's a standard printed form. It was a standardized national form used by the Army all over the country. The name of the officer, Colonel J. Snelling, is up here, and then his rank is indicated. And then on this area of the, of the voucher, the, 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 uh, the colonel enumerates the months for which he's claiming pay, uh, and the pay that he's claiming in itemizations. Down to a total, he's claiming a total pay of $826.88 for a period that covers eight months, or uh, uh, yeah, eight months. Um, and his signature appears in the bottom right. The officer was required to sign this document. So all of these documents were personally signed by officers of the United States Army. And over here lists the name of the paymaster who actually paid uh, Joseph, the, the Colonel Snelling. Uh, paymasters held the rank of major, and uh, they personally were required to supervise all of the data and all of the information, make sure it was correct before sending it out to the Paymaster General in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to show you right now a blow up of this portion of the form called the Description of Servant. This is from the same document, just blowing up the, that, the, the, the servant description. If an officer wanted to claim that he had a servant and qualify for what was called servant pay, he had to list, he had to respond to the information that was in this box. So it asked for the name and complexion and height and eyes and hair, basically the same kind of information they kept on everybody in the Army, privates, uh, officers, etc. The first two servants Colonel Snelling listed were white servants, complexion light. He lists the first and last name for each of them. The last servant he names is Mary, no surname given, which was typical for slaves. Slaves were almost never given the, the dignity of a surname in these forms. And in parenthesis, a slave. And her race or complexion is given as black. That is a, that's an example of, um, of a form that was submitted right from this post uh, 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 and under which Colonel Snelling claimed his, um, his pay. Now, when I saw these documents, I asked, where are they? How can I get my hands on them? And all I was able to learn is that they're in a collection of the National Archives, and if I went out there, I could probably find them. Now, it turns out that these records are still kept, still maintained in the form and in the order in which they were preserved by the Army. Uh, but they're part of a massive collection today of Army payroll records in the National Archives. They've never been indexed. They've never been microfilmed. Most of them, I concluded, had never been looked at. They're part of, a, the, as I said, a massive collection. It fills more than 1,740 boxes, each of which is crammed full of thousands. I estimated there are about a million pieces of paper in those 1,740 boxes. Now, I'd like to show you another servant description. This is the second one, or similar to the second one I was given before I went out to the archives. This is from the surgeon, Dr. John Emerson, also at Fort Snelling. He covers the period June through October of 1836, which I think is the first period after Dr. Emerson arrived at this post. And he lists his servant, Ethelred. Actually, the pronunciation of that that's correct, I learned this summer, was Ethelred. And I learned that from a descendant of Dred Scott, because this is a document that refers to Dred Scott. And it's, if, you, if you want a piece of slavery, American slavery trivi trivia to take with you today, it's only from these documents that we know the origin and back 
and, and the, the original basis for Dred Scott's first name. There were a number of academic theories about how Dred got his name and whether he acquired that name only after Dr. Emerson purchased him. But Efeldred was a family name of the Blow family, which was the family that owned Dred when he was born, Dred Scott when he was born. So this document is clear proof that that was his full name given to him by his masters and that he later shortened his name. And sometimes Dr. Emerson used his, the shortened version of his name on his pay vouchers. And so, you, so here you see him referred to simply as Dread. It was spelled in various ways by various officers. I think I've now collected a total of between 70 and 80 of these documents that specifically refer to Dred Scott. And they tell a fascinating tale that I don't have time to tell tonight, but that's just one of many tales these documents tell. So when I went to Washington to look through these records, it didn't take long, as I say, to, to find them. They, 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 um, and, and I learned that they were kept in rough, not perfect, but rough chronological order. And since I knew that Joseph Godfrey had been born in the 1830s, I asked if I could be brought a sample of the records from that period of time. Uh, and now I was selecting that for a particular reason for the, my Godfrey story, but I've since learned that that was a totally lucky accident that I happened to pick that period. For it was not until much later that I realized that I had picked the period that I've now identified as the heyday of slavery in Minnesota, which lasted for nine years, from 1828 to 1836. Now, I spent only about two days at first going through these documents from the 1830s. And I copied everything I could find that related to Fort Snelling. But I realized when I examined the documents I'd copied during those two days that I had collected more new, specific information about the history of slavery here at Fort Snelling and therefore in Minnesota in just those two days of looking at those Army records than I had found in years of painstaking research from all kinds of sources back in the Historical Society and at other locations. The files revealed the names of about seven officers who had never before, as far as I knew, been identified as Minnesota slave masters. And just as importantly, they provided the names of the officers' slaves and the years they were present here at Fort Snelling. Obviously, Joseph Godfrey, who was growing up just across the river in Mendota, in Alexis Bailey's log cabin, spent his early years in an environment where the enslavement of African Americans was not an unusual practice, but the norm. This is a period of time when two generalizations can be made about the su entire southern half of the area that is today the state of Minnesota. First, during those nine years, a substantial majority of prominent white residents, now there wasn't a big white population at that time, admittedly, but uh, of those who did live here in the fur trade and uh, officers at the fort, the Indian agency, the sutler's office, and other people who were collateral to those institutions. A substantial majority of those white residents were slaveholders. Second, virtually every African American who lived in, in, in this region during those nine years was enslaved. To make a very long research story short, after I saw how much could be proved about slavery in this area by looking at the Army's files, I returned to the archives time after time to look through more and more of those voluminous files. Not long after my first exposure to the records, I located the pay vouchers for Captain John Garland, covering the period when he was said, by sources at the Historical Society, to have brought a female slave, unnamed, to Fort Snelling, the woman he sold to Alexis Bailey, and I had been unable to locate her name by any other means. And here's a copy of the document I found. This is a pay voucher, or the, the servant description from a pay voucher submitted by Captain John Garland. I think it's the first one he submitted after he was uh, assigned to Fort Snelling as a quartermaster came here in July of 1826. And this was the crucial piece of information for me, the name of his slave, Courtney. She's referred to over here, 
as a slave. He identifies her as a slave. So I knew from that the name of the woman I believed to be Godfrey's mother. And fortunately for my purposes, it was an unusual name. In fact, it was the only time in looking through hundreds of thousands of these documents that I found a slave with that name. And that was uh, exceptionally helpful. And once I had that name, uh, I was able then to uh, track her down. And we all, uh, I'll mention in a minute. But first, I want to show you an earlier pay voucher. Once you realize how this pay system worked, that every officer had to file one of these forms every time they drew their pay, then it dawns on you that if you look hard enough, you can find any officer anywhere in the country, uh, wherever he was, from 1816 to 1860, and, to, and see at least what he put down in his pay claim. And here's a much earlier pay claim that was filed by the same officer, Captain John Garland, in July of 1821, five years before he came to Fort Snelling. And you'll notice this is a different servant description form. In the early years of the servant pay system, uh, individual paymasters scattered around the country were permitted to use their own forms. And some of them used different forms. And this one, who was assigned, this paymaster who was assigned to the Detroit area, used a form that required the, the officer to indicate the, the age of the servant. The earlier form didn't have that information on it. Excuse me, the later forms didn't have that information. Notice it's Courtney again. She was nine years old when she first became, she may have been eight, but she was no younger than nine when she first became the slave of an army officer uh, in, in Detroit. Now, Armed with her name and a bit of the background of her circumstances and with the suggestion of yet another researcher, I, all along the way I was helped by a, a, a whole string of researchers who were looking at similar issues and, and tipped me off to things. Uh, I heard that there might be a freedom lawsuit that Courtney had brought in the state of Missouri. And I had known about these documents, and I had looked through them before, but there are a lot of them. And since I didn't have this name, I had overlooked this one. But when I went back to that collection, I found, sure enough, there was a freedom suit brought. It turns out, from the details of that lawsuit, that Alexis Bailey, who owned Courtney and Godfrey, was taken, what, what happened was, in, in about 1835, Alexis Bailey took Courtney and an infant son she had named William, who was less than a year old, down to the St. Louis slave markets and sold both of them. But he kept Godfrey as his slave back here in Minnesota. And in St. Louis, Courtney, was, Courtney and her baby were sold to a prominent businessman named Rayburn. And the caption of the lawsuit is Courtney, a woman of color, versus Rayburn. Of course, Courtney, in, that, in the beginning of that lawsuit, gave a statement under oath that briefly told the story of her life. By the way, Courtney's lawyer was one of the anti-slavery lawyers who represented Dred Scott later in one of America's, in, in not one of, in by far the most famous freedom suit ever brought in America. The legal theory of Courtney's freedom case was exactly the same and brought in the same state as Dred Scott's case. Even involved the same forts, Fort Snelling and a fort, uh, and a fort in, uh, in uh, and, and Fort Crawford in uh, Wisconsin. The legal theory of Courtney's freedom case, excuse me, um, the argument was in this case, in both cases, that because these slaves had been brought to free territory and had lived there for years, they were entitled to court-ordered emancipation. And in her statement under, under oath, Courtney told how she had been born into slavery on a Virginia plantation owned by James Garland, a prominent Virginian who later served in the United States Congress. That was Captain Garland's brother. And Captain Garland, while visiting Virginia on a furlough in 1820, purchased Courtney and took her north 
at the age of nine, as shown by these documents, and, and that age, by the way, is confirmed in the freedom suit, into a life of northern slavery that would last 15 years. In effect, Courtney, contrary to the known common patterns of slave sales elsewhere, was sold north. Courtney also recounted how Alexis Bailey later bought her from Garland. And she said that Bailey had brought her and her young son, William, to St. Louis and sold them there to Rayburn. Now, there's some very interesting details in that lawsuit about how it was resolved, and they're in my book. But suffice it to say that Courtney secured her freedom for herself and for her infant son through the courts of the slave state of Missouri, and that she then moved to Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, which is where Fort Crawford is, which was always the sister fort of Fort Snelling, 300 miles downriver. And with little William, she uh, established her life there and lived the rest of her life. And he lived for a substantial period of time in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, uh, as free citizens. So by no later than 1837, Courtney was free. But Bailey kept Godfrey, as I said, in slavery back in Minnesota where he remained in bondage in supposedly free territory for another 10 years. This is an unusual twist on the tragic but common story of a slave child being sold away from his or her mother. In the Godfrey family, the mother and her baby were sold, while the mother's young child, Joseph, was retained by the selling slave master. Slave master. In any event, Courtney was separated from her son, Godfrey, who was then about five or six years old, by the bitter vagaries of slavery. Now, it's often said that fact can be stranger than fiction. And when I was struggling to fill in the large gaps in Godfrey's life story, many per people urged me to complete the blanks with fiction, something I always refused to do. But if I had written a story claiming that Godfrey was separated from his mother at an early age, and then kept in slavery in free territory for 10 years, 10 years after the courts of a slave state had emancipated his mother and brother, the tale would have sounded too far-fetched to be credible. But that's exactly what happened. After his mother was sold, Godfrey was forced to labor for French-Canadian fur traders. Alexis Bailey and his family, whom I already mentioned, and then for Bailey's brother-in-law, Oliver Fairbowl. And remarkably, the log cabin in which Godfrey was last held in slavery still exists and can be visited today at the landing in Shakopee, which was at that time, the time Godfrey was held as a slave there, called Fairbowl Springs. There is a spring that flows underneath Highway 101. It still exists. And that's where this cabin was. It's been moved across the road and into the, the landing park and can be visited today. It's been, it, it's still maintained as the way a fur trader's cabin would be envisioned, but you can see it's in excellent shape. Uh, and that's the original cabin. Now, as while Godfrey was working as a slave at this location at Fairbow Springs, that he was approached by a fervently anti-slavery missionary, Alexander Huggins who persuaded him to make a run for freedom. Godfrey initially sought refuge in Huggins' home in Traverse de Sioux, downriver from, uh, or upriver, I should say. It's, it's, it's south, but it's actually upriver on the Minnesota River from, from Shakopee. But in a few days, about three days, after spending three days with Huggins, Godfrey was afraid he'd be taken back into slavery by his masters. So he ran again to the only place he thought he could seek secure sanctuary to live among the Dakotas, whose language and customs he had learned in the fur trade. Now, until about four years ago, I believed that since Godfrey was kept here in slavery until the late 1840s, he might have been the last slave to reside in this area and in the area that became Minnesota. But then I decided to expand my study of the Army's payroll records to encompass the whole country. I had focused up at this point in time on Fort Snelling and had documented what I thought to be the full story, and I'd gone through 1846, 
and found all the documents I could find relating to Fort Snelling and its sister fort, Fort Crawford, made copies of those, and I thought I pretty much had the whole story at that point. Uh, but then I decided to expand it, um, and I was actually uh, uh, to, to, to include the entire country. Uh, and I, from that point forward, went back through the entire collection, starting at the end, and go, starting at the end of the collection and going backwards. And I endeavored at that point to locate and copy every single document in those 1,700 boxes that specifically referred to a slave. And that's what I've done over the last four years. Uh, and that, is, that comprises a, 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 a database which single space runs 500 pages long to give you an idea of how many entries there are. Now, I wanted to say a few words specific to Fort Snelling and to Minnesota at this point that um, uh, show that in these last four, the difference between what happened before four years ago, my perspective is more than four years ago, and my perspective since I've gone through all the rest of these records. Uh, I, uh, when I first found a lot of new information about slavery here in Minnesota, I was thinking, well, gee, I found a lot that Minnesota didn't know about the extent of slavery in Minnesota, and, and uh, so there was a lot that wasn't known. But when I started to expand and found slaves in other states, and then tried to go to the state historical, did not even try, did go to the state historical societies, look for uh, source materials from other states, those other states comparable to Minnesota, um, I found that Minnesota had been far ahead of the rest of the country in gathering information about slavery here than the other states about whom I gathered information, I've gathered information over the last four years. In fact, as far as I could determine from looking through this whole collection now, the very first scholar who discovered this collection of invaluable records was Helen White, who worked for years for the Minnesota State Historical Society. Uh, and her son, Bruce White, has also done scholarly work and still is interested in this field. She looked at the records uh, in, uh, maybe 30 years ago now. And at that time, she was trying to focus, apparently, on the Josiah Snelling years. So she copied several hundred pay vouchers from Fort Snelling and other forts in this area from the 1820s. Now, interestingly, I now know she picked a period that was a period where there were relatively few slaves here. So her experience would have been the opposite of mine. She would have gone through 100 documents before she found one that referred to a slave, whereas in the period I started out with, it was the exact opposite. Uh, I found lots of them for every voucher I found that related to Fort Snelling. Minnesota Historical Society, in addition to pioneering the location of these documents and bringing some of them back here to the collection of the Historical Society, I also learned it was distinctive in seeking out sources of collections of documents like the uh, Lawrence Tolliver Papers, the Indian agent who was a Virginian who brought a number of slaves to Minnesota nearby. He was situated right next to the fort. And that's a huge uh, uh, and valuable collection that relates to the history of, of slavery here. Uh, and there are a number of other articles that were solicited. People were solicited to write articles about Fort Snelling's early history, and several of those articles refer to individual slaves or individual officers who had slaves. So when you put it all together, Minnesota had a fairly good base of knowledge before I ever got in, in the act. And when I compare what I've learned since with what other states have known, I just thought I'd pass it along, that when you, when you consider what uh, Helen White, her son Bruce, and Steve Osman, who also gave me one, he was the one who gave me the, uh, uh, the uh, Colonel Selling document. Uh, he's, he's a former director here at the, uh, whatever the title is, the leader of, um, of this fort. Uh, and there are many other scholars in Minnesota who, who really created the foundation for the work I've done. And I've come to really appreciate that work. And in fact, when I look back on it, had it not been for Helen White, had it not been for others who then saw the value of her work and followed up on it, such as Bruce, her son Bruce, I wouldn't be here today because I wouldn't have known about those documents and would never have known how valuable the Army's records are for reconstructing the history of slavery in America, in vast parts of America. Now, Switching back to what, what I've learned over the last four years, 
one of the many surprising findings that emerged, have emerged from my study over these last four years is conclusive evidence that army slavery in Minnesota did not end with the departure of Dred Scott in 1840, as had previously been thought. During the years 1851 to 1858, there was a resurgence of army slavery here after the region had been formally organized as Minnesota Territory. Now, some of you know what happened in Minnesota in 1851 to create the need for a beefed up military presence. The Dakota Treaties were negotiated and signed, and white negotiators led by Alexander Ramsey wanted some battle-hardened army regulars to be here to assure that things didn't get out of hand. So the 6th Infantry Regiment was sent to Minnesota. And when that regiment arrived, army slavery returned. For the next four years, the highest ranking U.S. officer in Minnesota was the 6th Regiment's Colonel, excuse me, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Lee. He became the Commandant at Fort Stelling, and he led the contingent of troops that was intended to serve as the iron fist backup to the treaty negotiations. And when the Dakota people, pursuant to the treaties, reluctantly moved to their new reservation along the Minnesota River in 1853, it was Lieutenant Colonel Lee who selected the site for Fort Ridgely near the, that reservation. And when the fort was ready for occupancy, Lee brought along two of the four slaves he kept when he became commandant of that fort. Here's a pay voucher for Lieutenant Colonel Francis Lee when he was commanding at Fort Snelling. Um, now, this is a little, th th this name is Jenny. I know that because he filed so many vouchers for her over the years um, that th it's hard to read the handwriting here, but there's no question that's Jenny, uh, whom he purchased y many, many years earlier in the South. Um, at an auction sale when he married a southern woman and Jenny was about to be auctioned off to strangers and the family pleaded with him to keep her in the family. So he, he purchased her and then she had a string of children and his children also became uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lee's slaves as well, one of whom was Joe. And you see the word slave over here in brackets. Um, and this was in 1851. And this is one Three years later, Lee has been continuously in Minnesota, identifying slaves regularly on his pay claims. Over here he uses the word slaves. And this is for Fort Ridgely. Now, I mean, I, 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 when I saw that document in the archives, or I saw one like this, there were several from Fort Ridgely, I said, there is nobody in the world who knows there were slaves at Fort Ridgely. Uh, Fort Ridgely, because of its importance in the Dakota War, has been studied very carefully. But there was just no knowledge of the fact. There was, no, there was nothing like there has been for this fort to indicate there were at least some slaves there. There was, as far as I know, as far as I know, there still is not any collateral reference to those slaves at Fort Ridgely. These documents are the only evidence we have that they were there. But it's absolutely, I think, clear-cut evidence. Then in 1855, the Army was expanded by the creation of several new regiments including the 10th Infantry Regiment. The man serving as the Secretary of War at that time is said to have personally selected, selected the officers who would lead these new regiments. Who was the Secretary of War in 1855? Jefferson Davis, who later became the President of the Confederate States of America. In retrospect, we, wouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised that a group of officers handpicked by Jeff Davis would include some die-hard slaveholders who would bring their enslaved servants wherever they went. And that's what happened when the 10th Regiment replaced the 6th Regiment at Fort Snelling in Minnesota in 1855. Not since the 1830s had so many officers declared on their pay vouchers that they were keeping slaves in Minnesota. At Fort Snelling during those years, the Commandant, the Paymaster, the quartermaster and the surgeon were all slaveholders, and there were a few others. Some of them, as I said already, brought slaves to Fort Ridgely. And although no, no, one, no officer specifically identified a slave at Fort Ridgely, I believe there's strong circumstantial evidence that there were officers who also brought slaves to that fort. Uh, 
I identified a, to I identified a total of seven officers who kept 13 slaves in Minnesota during the years 1851 to 1858. Not continuously necessary, but during that period. And other officers indicated in their pay forms that their servants were black, but did not write the, down the word slave. And they can be shown in some instances to have been slaveholders too. So when I use figures that I gave before, those are the most conservative and indisputable figures, but they understate the true incidence of slavery. Now, this new slavery story is highly re relevant to an understanding of the likely perspectives and predicaments of other African-American residents of early Minnesota, including Joseph Godfrey. While Godfrey was living on the reservation with his Dakota wife, officers from the same army that had enslaved his mother were keeping slaves nearby at Fort Ridgely. Imagining how disquieting that development would, it would have been to a Minnesota fugitive slave who had no free papers and who had never been emancipated. Based on the studies I've conducted and on my earlier research, I've come to two overall conclusions about Minnesota's African-American and slavery history. First, to an extent greater than any other state that achieved statehood before the Civil War, Minnesota's slavery history is linked to the practices, policies, and records of the United States Army. Second, because of the Army's dominance of Minnesota slavery, a higher proportion of the slaves kept here are named in official federal records, these documents, the Army's payroll files. And that's higher than any other state that I have found in my study. And that means that to a unique extent, slavery here was knowingly permitted and subsidized by the Army using federal money. And to understand a little more detail about how and why that's true, we need to take a closer look at the Army's pay system. Starting in 1816, a new federal law governing the pay of Army officers was enacted. The law gave all Army officers a perk of employment called servant pay. Each officer from the lowest second lieutenant to the highest ranking general became eligible to draw extra pay if he kept what was called a private servant. Lieutenants and captains were entitled to draw extra pay for one servant, while higher ranking officers, depending on their rank, could get extra pay for from two to five servants. That extra pay amounted to an average of 15 to 20 percent of an officer's salary. In other words, if he didn't claim a servant, his pay was 15 to 25 percent less. If he claimed a servant, he could get that extra pay. But it wasn't automatic. The officer had to receive it. Excuse me, in order to receive it, the officer actually had to keep a servant and had to fill in one of these forms providing a written identification of his servant so that the paymasters could verify that the extra pay was justified. Now, neither the servant pay law nor army regulations or forms said anything about the use of slaves as servants. A private servant could be any person whose services were used by the officer, male or female, free or slave, adult or child. Frankly, the Army didn't care. They paid you the same no matter who you hired or who you obtained. Servant pay was always the same. It, it adjusted as the salaries of the privates adjusted because servant pay was pegged to what it cost the Army to support a private soldier. So as private salaries increased, so did servant pay. Now, since people in bondage were often the least expensive form of labor, whether purchased by the officer or hired by him from a slave owner for a period of months or years, which was common at this fort and common in most forts, the Army's pay system both encouraged and rewarded the use of slaves as servants. And the cheapest of all slaves were children, like nine-year-old Courtney. It was no accident that several of the earliest slaveholders here at Fort Snelling had children as their slaves uh, and kept them for years at a time because that was the most lucrative use of this particular pay system. Now, as far as I've been able to determine, this pay system was unique to the Army. The Navy didn't have it. 
and neither did any other branch of the federal bureaucracy. Indeed, I doubt that there was anywhere else in the country outside of the Army in which it was possible to get what amounted to adult level wages for keeping a child slave. There's little doubt that Captain Garland made a bundle of money by keeping Courtney in slavery. She is thus a perfect example of how the pay system induced officers to use enslaved servants for reasons that aren't found anywhere else in American slavery. And it's, e it's equally important to understand that the Army's pay system created ongoing institutional Army knowledge and approval of the officers' slave keeping in places like Minnesota. These were official Army forms. And they had to be reviewed first by the majors who were the paymasters, then they had to be sent out to Washington, the paymaster general, where they were reviewed again, and they were kept in as official files, and they were consulted periodically by the Army uh, for all kinds of uh, bookkeeping and other purposes. So this was an official record that the Army had from which they knew, people who administered the system knew, there was a record of, a substantial record of where officers were keeping um, uh, slaves. For Army slaves kept in a place like Minnesota, where slavery was illegal, it's thus true that the Army as an institution had ongoing knowledge and repeatedly subsidized officers for slaveholding that violated federal law. The Army's own records thus established that it was an ongoing policy, albeit a policy never publicly announced, to permit the practice of slavery by its officers when posted in the free territory that became Minnesota, and to use federal funds for doing so. Moreover, using the Army's records, it's now possible for the first time to prepare a chart of the incidents of slavery in Minnesota. Since Army officers were the principal users of slaves, if we simply, as, as I've begun to do, uh, make charts based on what the information that's contained in the pay vouchers, it's possible to see how the incidence of slavery varied over time. And this is the chart I prepared. Now, it's not perfect because uh, it understates, first of all, it understates the incidence of slavery almost throughout because it relies only on officers who specifically use the word slave. So it's the most conservative measure. But I do think from the experience I've had in looking at the documents that, this, that the shape of this chart is a correct depiction of the incidence of slavery and its variation um, in Minnesota over the period from 1819, when Fort Snelling was open, till 1860, right before the beginning of the Civil War. I divided this into three-year increments. And you see in some of these periods, there were zero slaves. The most obvious thing that sticks out in this chart is these three years. Remember I said that the heyday of slavery was from 1828 to 1836. That's this nine-year period. Compare that with the first nine years. What it, basically, the years when, for most of that time, Josiah Snelling was the commandant here. In general, if you, if you look at all of the officers who were here during the first nine years, 90% of them did not have slaves. In fact, they didn't even use black servants, so that you can't even infer that they might have been using slaves. The use of slaves during those first nine years was extremely unusual, and that's why when I said, when Helen White looked first at this period, she wouldn't have seen very much. Note the contrast, huge jump, during this period, 90% of the officers did name slaves. 90% of the officers who had Fort Snelling during those nine years for any appreciable period identified a slave, not necessarily every month, but at some time during their tenure here as an officer at the post. So you went from 10% to 90%, and it drops back down again in 1837. And on, down to virtually none during the Mexican War when all the officers are down in Mexico. Uh, then you've, I've already talked about this blip at the end, uh, and this isn't working again, um, for the, from, the, from the 1850s, which isn't as high as the peak, but it's still, as you can see, a significant bulge. Now, as a shape of a slavery chart, 
Anyone who's ever looked at charts for states or the north or the south knows that the general tendency is to have a slavery chart that either goes up pretty progressively and without any big ups and downs. In the south, slavery went from a relatively modest level to a very high level during the same period of time. In the north, it went from a moderately low level to zero by 1850 in all of the 14 states that voted Lincoln into the presidency. Um, but this chart looks more like a roller coaster. And what could possibly explain these gyrations? Now, the bulge there in the middle is so pronounced that people who had no access to these documents had picked up from, from, the, from the records that existed already that, uh, or had limited access to these documents, um, they picked up that there was this big drop in about 1837. And there were lots of efforts to attribute that to change in the labor force, change in politics, change in law, external forces, social trends. In the end, I concluded none of those was pertinent, or at least not very relevant. What happened in 1828 to cause this huge bulge that you see in the chart? The answer is remarkably simple. The Army brass in Washington decided to send Lieutenant Colonel Zachary Taylor's 1st Infantry Regiment from its long-term base in Baton Rouge, Louisiana to the forts on the upper Mississippi River, the most important of which were Fort Snelling and Fort Crawford. The 1st Infantry was loaded with slaveholders, as shown by these documents. When you look at what they, what they were doing, what they were reporting to the Army when they were in Louisiana, the Army knew they were slaveholders because it had the records to show it. And when they were sent up to Fort Snelling, they brought their human chattel with them. And they brought the institution with them. Remember that that's the, slave, that's the heyday period, and that's, that's why it is the slave day period, because that's the period of time that the 1st Infantry was, uh, was, was here at Fort Snelling. And the plunge in 1837 was not due to political or social causes or to labor rest or anything else. It was due to the 1st Infantry being sent back south to Florida to fight the Seminoles. And when they left, they took their slaves and pretty much the institution of slavery as it had been practiced uh, as strongly as it had been in Fort Snelling with them. Um, so I've concluded that at least for Fort Snelling, the biggest fluctuations in the incidence of slavery here are attributable more to internal army explanations than to external political or social or legal explanations. And that um, uh, that's actually what, what determined uh, the, the predominance of slaves here during that peak period. Now, I've talked about the incidence of slavery in Minnesota and here at Fort Snelling. But I'd like to close by offering some observations about the nature of slavery in Minnesota. Sometimes it's either suggested or implied that slavery was more civilized here or more gentle here than slavery elsewhere. After all, most Minnesota slaveholders were well-educated and distinguished people who used their slaves as household servants. There were no whip-wielding, brutal overseers in Minnesota, no coffles of chained slaves marching through towns, and no public auction block where human beings were sold. But there's ample evidence that Minnesota slaves, including Joseph Godfrey, were whipped, beaten, or subjected to other forms of corporal punishment, and that slave families were ruthlessly split up by selling off one or more family members. One report refers to a slave who was punished or restrained by an iron collar here. Another refers to finding the badly mutilated body of a female slave who was whipped to death by an unnamed army captain. Her body ended up five miles downriver in the pig's eye slough, five miles below the court, exactly where you'd expect to find a body that was thrown in the river below Fort Stilling. Slavery was a pernicious institution wherever it was practiced. Even the most decent masters could become vicious and violent if angered, drunk, or provoked. 
Surely not all slaves here were beaten or brutalized, but there's enough evidence to conclude that there was no Minnesota nice version of slavery. If nothing else, Joseph Godfrey's story and the story of army slavery teaches us that nor the North Star that gave this state one of its nicknames was not always a beacon of liberty for African Americans. Thank you very much.